Welcome to Biola University. It's so great to have you join us. My name is Dr. Tim Milhoff. I'm a professor of communication at Biola University and also the co-director of the Winsome Conviction Project. This year, we've launched a project that's going to focus for the next five years on reintroducing compassion, civility, kindness into our discussions about things that we differ with. Whether it's between Christians or those outside the Christian community, we want to reintroduce demeanor and courtesy and winsomeness back into our conversations. And I want to introduce you to my co-host, Dr. Joy Qualls, a good friend, a colleague, and I'll let you, you introduce yourself. Well, thanks, Tim. I am Dr. Joy Qualls. I am the Associate Dean of the Division of Communication in the School of Fine Arts and Com here at Biola. And I want to add that things like the Winsome Conviction Project come out of what we do and how we study communication at Biola. We look at how we use communication and how we are used by communication. And so this partnership is a great opportunity to join with you. Uh and one of the reasons we're friends, we love politics. <laughs> and because we teach communication, we love debates. So let me read you two headlines from the same newspaper that covered both the first debate and then the last debate. This is what the New York Times said about the first debate. No winners, one loser, America. And we all saw that debate and many of us were uncomfortable with what we saw. So we all held our breaths <laughs> heading into the very last one before the election. And here in beautiful simplicity is what the New York Times said in their headline about the last debate, a normal debate. And it was very encouraged very mm -hmm. with how it started. There's a communication theorist called John Gottman who says how a conversation begins is how it's going to end. So all of us were just a little bit worried uh, how we're going to cut the mic. Would it, would it work? And I don't know about you, Joy, but the first part of it, when there was no interruptions, I was deeply encouraged. Yeah. So... I was in a unique position last night uh, because we had a late meeting and I ended up having to start the debate in my car. So I was listening on the radio. And one of the interesting studies in political communication is that between the Nixon-Kennedy debates, mm. the first ever real presidential debates of the modern era and televised. Those who watched the Nixon-Kennedy debate on television had a different response than those who listened to it on the radio. Oh. So it was interesting to be in that position last night to where I knew the format was going to be different, but I wasn't expecting to only be able to listen to it. And I was pleasantly surprised by uh, not only the candidates' interactions with each other, but the moderator's choice of the rapid fire questioning mm -hmm. and the ways in which she um, handled the time constraints. Now, I knew the mu mic muting was there, yeah. but I couldn't see it and I couldn't see what the responses to it were. So I wasn't hearing that happen and it just felt like a good conversation. Uh, Joy, I had my pen ready to go. I had a piece of paper and had a pen and out walked Vice President Biden. He had his mask on and, bright, uh, and President Trump walks out. He doesn't. And I literally said to my wife, here we go. Mm -hmm. Here we go. And mm -hmm. I was ready to write like a madman, knowing mm -hmm. that we were going to do this. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, I was so pleasantly surprised, put my pen down. I mean, there was one point where uh, President Trump wanted to speak, but he hadn't quite gotten the permission of the moderator. And he goes, excuse me, would this, would this be OK? And she was great. She was like, yeah, take 30 seconds. He was like, thank you. And then he went into it. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. That's awesome to see, because we know how much is on the line, how much pressure these two men are under the last debate before an important election. That really encouraged me. But I almost wonder if the constraints of the mic muting, knowing mm. that that was going to happen, helped the teams in preparation for their communication situation to say, this is going to come across even worse with the mic muting if we fight this. Mm. And so mm. I think knowing silently that this constraint was there because you notice there was only a couple of times throughout the entire 90 minutes where the mics cut them off. Uh, every other time they managed the clock well, they managed their, and then sometimes they had to stop themselves, right? But they managed uh, the situation well. And so I think that's also important to understand those outside communication constraints. And when we as humans allow ourselves to work within that space of those constraints, really good conversation can take place. 
We just had David French here. We're both huge fans of huge David fans, French. Yes. Please check out winsomeconviction.com and, and uh, you'll see a bunch of the interactions we've had. And also just check them out on YouTube. Just put in David French Biola. He said this, Joy, that, that really struck me. He said, when our leaders do well, it literally trickles down. When they do poorly, it also trickles down. So uh, let's, let's give both men props. Watching that, there was a trickle down effect that if two men could stand there in front of the entire world, and it wasn't that pot shots weren't occurring. Right. I mean, there were some real strong claims about being unethical and things like mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. uh, um, Proverbs 19.11 says, it is to a person's glory to overlook an offense. Mm -hmm. And right. there was a lot of overlooking of potential offenses and digs. And I just watched both of them saying, you know, I admire what they did that they were able to, um, we'll talk later about nonverbals. Sure. I mean, we have to let sure. them be human. There were right. some interesting nonverbals, right. but, but that really encouraged me. And I thought if they can do it, maybe I can do it as well. Well, I think the misnomer of civil discourse and uh, the ability to have these conversations is that we don't have to only be nice. We don't mm. only have to agree with one another. We can have hard conflicting, challenging conversations and do it in a civil manner we, and a constructive manner. It's, and again, it's civil is not niceness. And I think we yeah, confuse yeah. those two things together. And so what I appreciated is that the concept of these debates to begin with, I mean, they're, they're not good debate. <laughs> right, so right, I, right. I, as, as somebody who's been a debater and has coached debate and has taught debate, they're, they're not debate as we yeah. understand yeah. them in, in the academic world and the competitive world. Sometimes they can just be overgrown press conferences. But what I think we saw last night was a way in which people who have very different visions of the world, very different visions for the country and very different ways to communicate those yeah. visions, yeah. have a discussion with three people, because we do really have to include the moderator in this, have a discussion amongst three people that was an invitational discussion instead of a combative discussion. And I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn yeah, from that. I love what you said. Civility doesn't mean you can't have conviction. And civility doesn't mean that we can't disagree with each other, but, but, but to not let it get out of control, not let it to flood the banks. The book of Proverbs says that a, a dispute is like a dam that absolutely bursts. And to be honest, I think most of America saw that the first debate. And what I think kind of brought us together, Marshall McLuhan talks about village moments. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, left, right, center watched the first debate and they were like, we don't want this. Right. This is not what we want. And kudos to our two candidates for hearing that message. That's right. And saying, you know what, we need to change and change it. Well, and I was concerned after the first debate leading into last night because Neil Postman, another cultural theorist, has talked in his book about amusing ourselves to death, yeah. that entertainment yeah. would become the death of culture. Yeah. And I heard from a lot of people after the first debate, well, but it was entertaining. And I thought, well, you know, perhaps if we were watching a reality television program, I wouldn't mind being entertained. But the problem with that is, is yeah. that this is not... That's not what this was. This is an audition for the highest position in the land. Yeah. And while I don't want it to be a deep dive into policy either, what I wanted were those visions. And yeah. I think we got that better last night. It was less entertainment, yeah. but to be honest with you, it was way more enjoyable. Yeah, and the high point was when the moderator actually quoted both of us. I thought that was a great, a she great was fantastic. moment in the debate. Maybe, maybe I read into that perhaps a little you, bit. Perhaps I don't you know. might have. I thought I heard. But, a, but I really would love to give props to Kristen yeah. Welker on yep. that because yep. she had a unique task yep. in front of her, not only being the moderator, yep. um, but being the female in the in the room. So now you have those dynamics. Mm. Uh, there had been some rather difficult discussion about moderators leading yeah. up to yeah. the the debate and. And I was so impressed, especially in the probably the first mm -hmm. um, 45, 50 minutes of the debate. Um, again, not just because the mics were muted, but the way she chose to ask the question. So she asked a lot of rapid yeah. fire yeah. questions that kept the conversation moving. But she also allowed them to say, as you said before, uh, can I respond to that? And then she allowed them that space. Yeah. But but she kept control of that and and did so with a, a strong 
strong voice and a yeah. powerful voice, yep. but she didn't enter herself into the conversation. There was a couple of times where she you almost got there. And, and yet I, under, I understand that too. The conversation yeah. got a little frustrating, but, um, but I really appreciated her participation in the conversation no, I thought as well. she was good. Thick skin is a gift from God. <laughs> it is. And she was also, even to the point, President Trump complimented her. Yes. To say, yes, hey, by the right. way, I think you're doing a really good job. I mean, yes. that was a kind of a cool moment. Yes. Uh, Joy, let's do this. Let, let's let's um, have some takeaways. Okay. And let's be honest. I think there were some things we should do and some things that we shouldn't do. But let me give you my first take on a principle that, that was forced upon them, but maybe we can take it away and not have it be forced upon us, but still do it. Seneca said, uh, a Roman philosopher, the best remedy for anger is delay. So here's what I liked about that. Uh, he knew, both candidates knew, you have your two minutes. I, even if I want to interrupt you, I can't because I'm going to be muted. It is really nice not to just jump in and disagree right away. Even if what a person says makes you angry, um, we don't want to just rush in and give a response. So I think that two minute uh, buffer is really nice for me to say to myself, okay, that did hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I did think that was unfair. Right. And I may even have thought you're just plain wrong, but I need to give myself just a little bit of time to fully understand what you're saying. And I want to respond in a gentle way, not with a harsh word. I think one of the challenges of understanding the communication process is that too often we listen to respond. Mm. We don't listen to hear yeah. and to engage with the other person. And I think that's the space that you're talking about yeah. is that gave them an opportunity. Now we can talk about the nonverbals and what yeah, that yeah, did in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. But I think, I think that gave, the, the other thing I'd like to mention is that two minute time frame. So, so I've also heard a lot of feedback of like, it takes them longer to ask the question that they have time to answer yeah. for. But one of the hallmarks of a skilled communicator is the ability to do what you have to do and to get your message across in whatever time you're given. So whether it's two minutes, yeah, five minutes, yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah. And so I actually appreciate as a, as a communication scholar, the short time frame because it's forcing them mm. to think mm. on their feet. Mm -hmm. It forces them yeah. to stay on topic as much as they possibly can. I mean, they ultimately get to choose whether yeah. they do or yeah. not. Um, but I actually think that those time constraints are also a, a positive communication factor. Uh, we're both married. Wouldn't it be interesting if in a marital disagreement, a referee stepped out and said, excuse me, Mr. Mihoff, you're just going to have to wait two minutes before you respond to your wife. And you're like, okay, all right, well, okay, that's probably good. And, and then to literally think, okay, how do I want to say this both in tone and content? That's right, that's right. Because the tone will kill you. We, right. we know that. I, I, man, that's nice. I, I remember Thomas Jefferson said, when angry count to 10, when really angry count to 100. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. That delay is kind mm -hmm. of a nice response that was put into the debate. And maybe we can take that away in our own personal discussions. Well, you mentioned nonverbals, which teaching communication, we know how important nonverbals are. So what did you pick up as you watched that uh, the nonverbal. So again, I started out listening. Yeah. So one of the things that happened, this is the tragedy of the West Coast, right? So <laughs> yeah. I'm used to these things happening yeah. in prime time or later, depending yeah, on yeah, where yeah. you live. But but on the West Coast, it's dinner time when this is happening. So I'm driving home, listening, get home, have to eat dinner with my family. So the second half of the debate I watched live, then yeah. I had to go back, yeah. watch yeah. the first half. And then what I did is I turned off the screen and listened to the second half to try to get a feel nice. so that it was relatively nice. even yeah. in my response. Yeah. So uh, I was so pleased with the first half because I couldn't see what was going on. But in the second half, yeah. two things happened. First of all, I think there was a bit of communication fatigue, which we can talk about yeah. um, in a little, a little later. Yeah. The other thing I think that happens, and, and you and I are on camera right now, and so some things are a little exaggerated on camera. Yeah. And I think perhaps both candidates could have used a little bit of coaching on yeah. the fact that yeah. their nonverbals don't need to be quite so dramatic. Yeah. There, there's a little overemphasis that needs to happen for the camera because subtle things are not always picked. Yeah up. Yeah. But when it's so over the top yeah. or there's yeah. so much, yeah. you know, then that there, there's a really fine line there when you're talking about what translates on the, on the camera. And I, and I don't think either one of them had good coaching in that regard. Yeah. I, 
uh, we know the statistics are all over the map. How much of our communication is nonverbal? There's there's a, a wild estimates of in the 90s. Yes, yeah. But certainly the emotional content really does come through our nonverbal. So it, we have to be aware. Even if we're doing that two minutes, I'm not going to respond. Boy, you're going to respond if you're nonverbal oh, or such. I mean, I can't imagine uh, my wife if she was saying something and I just went. <sighs> wow, <laughs> my wife would need a two minutes, right? To kind right. of call, <laughs> to right? just compose herself. And I'm not just picking on President no. uh, Vice President Biden because no. President Trump had his. Right, his, right. The yeah. eye rolling. The eye rolling. And listen, ask my daughter. Nobody does a better <laughs> eye roll than I do. Because <laughs> yeah. I've yeah. told her for years, yeah. like, you can attempt yeah. to compete with yeah. mommy on the eye yeah. rolling thing. Not going to happen. Yeah. Um, but there's a there's a dismissiveness that happens yeah. in those yeah. Yeah. in those responses. And I and I think that that's important. But I think, you know, you and I are learning. We're living on Zoom these days. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I've become yeah. hyper oh. aware of my nonverbals because somebody yeah. might say something yeah. in a meeting yeah. and and I'm thinking you have got to be kidding me yeah. but I can't let my nonverbals communicate that yeah. and again I think some coaching and some training yeah. on that could have been helpful to both candidates yeah my my favorite one joy is is I, I like to go like this just raise my glasses up and start to say something but don't finish it just go oh, I wish okay <laughs> Right? Because it hides your face. <laughs> <laughs> and it has plausible done. If Noreen's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm just praying for our trip. I'm just, I'm just kind of praying. Hey, you said something I really want to yeah. bring in. This is so good from a communication standpoint is, is to kind of put them in context, which is what have these two men been doing for an inhuman amount of time leading up to the debate? They've been on the campaign trail. They've been uh, meeting with people, uh, all the pressure of, I mean, imagine, Joy, if the whole world was watching us yeah. right now, yeah. I'd be like, ah. <laughs> so I, I, I like the fact that you brought that up is let's humanize both of them, that they are, every word is scrutinized mm -hmm. and That's they're right. tired. That's right. Walking in. That's right. Elaborate on that a little bit. So I think we have to understand the nature of communication fatigue mm -hmm. and, and the reality of that. When you're giving the same message over and over again, it's, yeah. it's why people tire of rote talking points is yeah. because it feels like it's yeah. so repetitive. But when you're talking every day over and over and over again to, to various audiences, yeah. it, it becomes a, a, a weighing factor. Then if there's other physical challenges yeah. that exist there, that also adds to it. So I think one of the things you saw come through last Last night is that the vice president um, seemed to have a, his stutter come through a little yeah, bit more. Yeah. Um, I I think I, I'm not an expert in this, but I think it had more to do yeah. with the fatigue factor. I think some of the president's uh, combativeness later on in the debate had something to do um, with the fatigue. I think the fact that the moderator didn't have as many rapid fire questions mm, had mm -hmm. something to do. I mean, the other thing is an hour yeah. and a half of sustained communication is a long time, yeah. even in their rallies and their meetings and things like that. If you notice, e even the president in his rallies where he might talk for a really long time, he's talking in about 10 minute yeah. chunks. Yeah. He's yeah. not constantly yeah. talking for an hour and a half. Well, this was pretty constant. Yeah. And so you started to see some of the decorum. You started to see some of the nonverbals. You started to see some of the ways in which mm -hmm. they, they dealt with mm -hmm. one another shift. I think there's a lesson in that for us. Mm. When we're tired, yep, yep, when we've yep. had a difficult time, when we're feeling particularly um, emotive about something, to yep. learn to have to say, I need to back away from yeah, this conversation. Yeah, and yeah. obviously they couldn't in the, in the uh, um, time frame of the debate, but I think perhaps it would have been really effective if one of them would have just taken a deep breath and pulled back because so the instinct is to jump in, yeah. right? And, yeah. and that's where you start to feed yeah. your worst impulses. And, and it happens to all of us and we have to be very careful about that. What we love um, being at Biola is we not only study communication, but we also study the scriptures. That's right. And it made me think, Joy, when you were saying this about tiredness, and you and I feel it, right? In the midst of all of this, uh, now teaching via Zoom, you're in leadership positions, you teach and now you have meetings nonstop, <laughs> is that's why God instituted Sabbath. That's right. Sabbath was a time for all of us. 
uh, Christian, non-Christian, to pull away. Uh, Puritans called it the market day of the soul, right? Mm. Just as you would go to pick up supplies that would last for a week or two weeks, we are to take reg regular rhythms of our lives and absolutely take that and uh, rest for a while. Now, it's really hard to do that on the campaign trail. I mean, that's, that's a crazy little time. But for the rest of us, it might be nice just to pull back and say, you know what, I need not to speak so much today, but to reflect on God's goodness, his charity, his grace to me, and maybe have that be part of, especially in a COVID world, that part of our daily rhythm to do that if we want to be good, gracious communicators. I think the other aspect that we need to remember as people of faith who have to communicate to a world that is potentially hostile to the way in which we enter into the conversation is that again, we can have these tough conversations, but we have to season them with salt as mm -hmm. the scripture mm -hmm. says yeah. to offer grace and a hope for why we believe what we believe. It doesn't mean that we can't uh, defend. It doesn't mean that we can't engage in some of the back and forth, but it means the way we do that is yeah. inherently different. And what we do here yeah. is an attempt to model that constructive communication, not only to our students and our constituents, but to a world who is watching what we're doing mm -hmm. and how we're engaging in this season. Boy, Joy, that's great. Hey, one quick thought of an application. Uh, somebody's gonna win and somebody's gonna lose. Some people are gonna be elated. Some people are gonna be deeply hurt. And that may be true in your family, your church, uh, in your corporation, in our nation, in your communities. So maybe we take a little bit of a buffer time before we respond to the election, before we hit that send button or sit down and talk to a family member that we know is elated. Um, we just have a little bit of time, maybe even as a nation, let's just let this set a little bit and deal with our emotions. And then maybe we start to have productive, winsome conversations, but not right away in real time. You know, Michael Ware, who is a political consultant, mm. wrote an article this week on the need for humility, even in winning. Oh, nice. And I think yeah. there's a lot to be said that even if your side wins the election, can you act in humility yeah towards those who yeah. will, yeah. in essence, be grieving, yep. regardless of, of, of where you stand in terms yeah. of your political positions. Thank you, Joy. Oh, well, thanks, if Tim. you like what we're, what we're talking about, this is what we do 24 seven at Biola University. We have a whole communication department. We study diversity, gender, leadership, rhetoric. Uh, we have a whole class on family. Uh, so please come check us out, both at Winsome Conviction Dot com, but then also go to Biola's webpage and just type in communication department and you'll meet all the faculty. We're just two members of a stellar department. So please come check us out. Hey, thank you so much for adding one more uh, screen time to us. We greatly appreciate it and we'll see you soon. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.